Again, thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, it's not too far of a drive from Jacksonville. There's no change in time zone, so it's appreciated. Um, I'm happy to say that I've been gamefully employed at all three sites. And at this time of year, I really prefer um, the Florida site, Orlando or Jacksonville, because of the ambient temperature. And around August is when I start thinking, Rochester's okay too, but by October that thought fades. I have no uh, conflict of interest and no um, external funding outside of um, nonprofit organizations. I do speak for uh, a group, WAMPU is ultrasound uh, for musculoskeletal medicine. I speak in various places um, for them, but it's a nonprofit organization. I'm on, I'm on their board as well. Um, with regards to spine injection, pretty much everything we inject is off-label. Um, I, I guess the exception would be normal saline or lidocaine or something like that. Everything, um, corticosteroids of particulate, non-particulate, off-label, anything else is off-label. So what are we trying to do today? We're kind of try to review the indication for spinal injections review the potential risks and benefits of these interventions, and you know, see if it can get our athletes back on the field sooner, but then also look at some novel treatments. What else is down the, coming down the pike and what else is uh, maybe available? Because as we know, corticosteroids um, are catabolic in nature and you don't wanna keep administering those if there's something else out there, especially for our high level athletes. So what happens to the spine as we age, as I tell my patients, as we mature? They like that better, but then they laugh. Um, Cacaldi Willis, a physician in the, in the 70s, kind of came up with this degenerative cascade of degenerative disc disease. He postulated that um, individuals suffer torsional or twisting injury, which most athletes can appreciate. And you go through these various phases where you have dysfunctional phase, and we'll see if the mouse works, basically where you, the annulus um, can start tearing and you can have leaking of the nucleus pulposa, and it can lead to an unstable phase where you can actually have herniation or severe loading of, or intermittent loading of the, of the facets that can lead to significant pain and if flared up, you can also have um, fractures of the pars, which we'll talk about in athletes. And then, so in this phase, you know, the, the teens, the 20s, the 30s, and then as you settle into 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, you start getting kind of a restabilization where the disc has kind of lost its height and you basically start developing stenosis due to all the, all the arthritic changes around the foramen, and you also develop a lot more facet pathology because you've basically lost the height of one of your three pillars which you stand on. You have the disc and you have the two facets. The disc is cut in half here and you're gonna load the facet a lot more. So try to think about that as, as you see your mature athletes, but also your young athletes who are more in the, uh, the unstable or dysfunctional phase. And again, hopefully with keeping our cores very strong, we can avoid all these phases and, um, and keep our core intact. <clears throat> so what are the potential spine generators? We have um, facet joints, of course. You have myofascial structures that hold everything together. The discs, which we'll elaborate on. Further down uh, toward the lumbosacral junction, you have the SI joint and the vertebral bodies themselves can cause pain. In short, you have a lot of joints in very close proximity, and this can lead to very challenging goal of figuring out which joint is causing which percentage of your pain. And when in doubt, I don't know if Dr. Esser's here today, but you can always fall back on acupuncture. You gotta be kidding, it still hurts. So, I was asked about two years ago to give a talk in um, Puerto Rico uh, with the title, Proven Interventional Techniques for Low Back Pain. 
I said, define proven. This could be a 30-second lecture. <laughs> so there, nor, there aren't any great RCTs on proven procedures uh, for spinal injections. And you ask, why is that? Well, pain studies are challenging in themselves. What's, what's a valid improvement in pain? And some of the literature has looked at this, and people have considered two-point reduction in your pain score from, let's say, an 8 out of 10 to a 6 out of 10 to be significant. And th at the lower numbers, they've considered a third of an improvement. So you go from basically 4 out of 10, and you drop it by a third to be st statistically significant. So depending on where you are on the pain scale, it's harder to say what's significant at the lower end. And with pain procedures, there's a dramatic placebo response, up to 50%, typically around a third. And I witnessed this when I was in Rochester. We were treating cancer patients with basically end-stage cancer of the pancreas for horrific abdominal pain. And we set up basically doing a celiac plexus block. We had a sham procedure and the actual procedure. And, we, and with the, the sham, we would go through elaborate acting, you know, with the beeping and the pictures and, you know, injecting, but not injecting too deep that we were anywhere close, but going through the whole procedure. And we had patients with 8 to 10 out of 10 cancer pain that was, you know, real pain based on CT imaging and their scores after a sham procedure say, I have zero pain right now. And you know they have cancer pain, but the mind is very powerful. So placebo um, response is very powerful. Okay, so let's go back to Cacaldi Willis and what we see as we mature. We see that facets become more degenerative. We see the foramen become more narrow where the nerve roots come out. But if you look at these degenerative processes over time, it happens very slowly. And the body's nerves tend to respond very forgivingly to very slow progressional um, um, squeezing or uh, stenosis. So dramatic stenosis from a herniated disc or um, from something pressing on the spinal cord, the body's very unforgiving, and you can have very traumatic loss of function. But I see patients in their 70s, 80s, 90s who the foramen are very narrow and their stenosis is very severe, and they barely have any symptoms or have no symptoms. These degenerative processes have happened over such a slow time, uh, such a long time, that the nerves have adapted, whereas a herniated disc is a different story. So we're going to look at kind of where we can put our needles, and this is kind of what we enjoy doing. Um, there's the medial branch blocks. There's the disc into the nucleus pulposa. There's epidural, and then there's coming along the side, the transferaminals. We're not going to focus much on sympathetic blocks and CRPS, and we'll also talk about vertebral augmentation, which involves cement. Of course, all of these uh, procedures have um, inherent risks. So what's the natural history of disc herniation? Sal and his colleagues back in the 90s kind of wrote a, a pretty much a definitive paper on looking at the natural progression of a disc herniation in various age groups. And they looked at what are favorable factors, unfavorable factors, and neutral factors. So some of them are obvious. If you're educated and motivated and you're self-employed, you're going to want to get to work much sooner. If you have a positive response to corticosteroids, um, it's a good chance that we have the right pain generator and you're going to do well. Large or sequestered discs, it's a little bit you know, counterintuitive that you can have a large disc as long as you're not having corticoquina or, or some you know, spinal cord injury. Most of those do well. Obviously, straight leg raise that's so significant that it crosses over to the other side um, is a poor indicator. Progressive return of neurologic uh, function within 12 weeks, again, positive. So what are some unfavorable uh, factors? Workers' comp, that's pretty much everything. Um, patients' literacy, they have to be able to understand that you're going to have to 
kind of wade through this, you know, you, most people, large majority of people will recover. If they don't respond to um, conservative therapy, if they have a progressive neurological deficit or cauda the handwriting's on the wall. In addition, the smaller discs tend to be the ones that give us the most problems at times. You think of large herniated discs tend to be resorbed over time, but a lot of the smaller discs can uh, present significant pain for a long period of time. It's small enough that the surgeons don't want to operate, um, but big enough that they have chronic pain. Now, what are some neutral factors? Age kind of doesn't bear out to be significant. Gender doesn't bear out to be significant. Whether you receive passive care or bed rest is kind of more than 90s. Uh, this day and age, you stay as active as you can tolerate. Questionable factors, again, the side of the disc, excuse me, size of the disc, where it is in the canal, and whether they have multiple level pathology. So transferaminal corticosteroid injections, um, procedures that I do um, pretty much every Wednesday and or Friday, um, they work well if there's intractable pain following a dermatome or pain in the dermatome. It's typically, if the pain is greater in the limb than in the back, they'll respond well. And they may have weakness or sensory changes um, and reflex changes, as long as they don't have progressive weakness, that's a red flag. Obviously, saddle anesthesia, bowel and bladder changes can be a little tricky because someone with a severe disc herniation <clears throat> may perceive to have much worsening pain when they um, try to defecate or use the restroom. But a lot of times, that's more the Valsalva response or their disc responding to their Valsalva versus I try to give them very stark examples like you, you wet yourself and you had no idea it happened or something very clear cut because a lot of elderly women have um, some mild urinary incontinence with um, various Valsalva maneuvers. So an acute disc herniation, um, you can see it quite well here at the lower lumbar level, and you can kind of anticipate that they're going to have weakness or pain in the nerve root leaving this area or the nerve root um, on the right side that's, that's coming down further south on the right. This would be a, a good target for a transferminal steroid injection close to the nerve root, um, but not obviously you don't want to get in the disc. And uh, here's just an, uh, a look at um, what we do, the actual procedure. You come in from lateral and you plant uh, the needle, or your goal is to getting the needle right next to, uh, the, or just distal to the transverse process. And the goal is to get good flow into the epidural space as well as along the nerve root. Again, looking at the pictures can be helpful. There are times when the disc is so far lateral that you really can't get good spread, or um, you end up doing a selective nerve root block. And there's other times when the pain is too severe and they can't even tolerate getting your needle close to this inflamed nerve root. So my patients say, can I fix this? And I tell them, the goal is not really for us to fix it, is to buy you time to allow your body to fix it and then strengthen your core that you don't keep stressing it. Um, because there were some elegant studies done in uh, Scandinavia where they looked at sciatic nerve roots in, excuse me, sciatic nerves in rats and they found that you can compress a sciatic nerve pretty much, and the, and the rat won't react. But if you sprinkle a little bit of nucleus pulposa on it, it significantly inflames the nerve that you get a really dramatic response. So your goal with the corticosteroid is really to stop the inflammatory, or at least calm down the inflammatory response as your body naturally deals with the disc herniation. And uh, another example, again, this is more rare, and we talked about it in the poster presentation this morning, is upper uh, lumbar radiculopathies. Typically, you have a reverse straight leg raise because the nerve distribution of um, L2, L1, L2, L components of L3 is more into the femoral nerve, and you have to stretch the femoral nerve or extend the leg, and that really flares it up versus 
all the lower lumbar, lumbar nerve roots are in the sciatic where the straight leg raise is positive. Okay, so in general, epidural steroid injections are the most common procedure we perform for radicular pain. Transforaminal approach uh, appears to improve the results compared to interlaminar approach. And uh, there might have been a question on this, why a series of three? A series of three was based on basically literature of how accurate we could do these under palpation guidance or how inaccurate we could do it. So you did a series of three because maybe they didn't all get there. Maybe you did um, injections into uh, the sub-Q space. But if you did three of them, hopefully one or two of them got there. So it's basic, basically, you know, the disadvantage of palpation guided, I try not to say blind in front of my patients, palpation guided injections. Um, these days, pretty much no one in the pain setting does these without contrast control fluoroscopically or CT or even MR guided, which is kind of ridiculous. But so the really, the series of three, now you can say, well, if you're a proponent of it, it's for other reasons, but originally um, it was because the lack of accuracy with one epidural. And how much relief, typically people get two to three months of significant pain relief. Um, again, it, not everybody responds. Um, one year efficacy is, is, is pretty neutral, whether you got it or not. And there's a couple studies that kind of lean toward avoiding surgery, but there's no great study, random, con randomized controlled study, that show you've avoided a surgical intervention by having the injection. So basically, the goal is to buy you time where you can strengthen your core once you tolerate it and let your body heal itself. Um, again, approximately six weeks of relief or longer, and uh, poorly selected patients uh, have no significant change. So, you know, if patients that are diabetic, smoker, um, obese, not very motivated, want a definitive fix now um, on chronic opioids, they're not going to do so well in general. But that can be for most procedures. Okay, as far as um, professional athletes, this was a study, um, specific, not a study, but kind of a case series at the New York Football Giants, where they looked at 34, excuse me, 37 injections um, in 27 distinct uh, lumbar disc herniations. So they think it got these patients or these football players back sooner. Um, it's relatively safe. Uh, obviously, these are highly motivated individuals. They're getting paid to play, not to be on the sidelines. Um, so it can be helpful. Again, it's in a time, and they did this in the hospital special services, they use, I'm sure they used fluoroscopy or CT. So who not to send? Well, you have to make sure they can be able to lay down in the prone position. So you send a patient, and they're in so much pain, they're curled up in a ball, and they can't lay on their stomach. It's not going to happen. Obviously, they um, can't have contra contrast allergies to what we're going to give. Usually, it's gadolinium adlinium or omnipake. Sedation is utilized in a lot of parts of the country, but in general, if you can get away without sedation, it's, mu it's much safer. And athletes, especially really tall or strong young guys, tend to have a vagal reaction. Um, they kind of buy sedation with their, uh, when, once they have one uh, episode of vagaling down and turning gray and having to go through the whole process. So previously, a lot of particulate corticosteroids were utilized, and they were very rare, but we had some horrific outcomes of paraplegia. Um, I, I know of two at Mayo that were before we went to dexamethasone, uh, one in radiology in Rochester and one in uh, pain in Rochester, and um, catastrophic uh, outcomes. So I always say there is a very small, and that we calculated the risk to be one in, one in 10,000, but still, I tell people if, that's, if that one person is you, it's a big deal. Since we've gone to non-particulate steroid, where the steroid size, size is smaller than, um, or the same size as red blood cells, we've not had any complications, which is reassuring. And because what is thought is, 
basically the needle went into the, uh, one of the radicular arteries or the Adankiewicz artery and caused spasm and anterior cord syndrome where they lost motor function below that level, typically L2. So what are alternates to steroids? Some of the studies, the control group got local anesthetic and they did just as well. So there are patients who are highly motivated who um, have poorly controlled sugars or cannot have a steroid where I'll offer them just to do a corticosteroid, excuse me, just to do a local anesthetic injection, more for the washout um, of all the inflammatory mediators and less for the prolonged corticosteroid benefit, or also for diagnostic purposes. We did do a study looking at clonidine, which showed, showed some benefit in Rochester, but I don't think it's reimbursed and it hasn't caught on. So this is another study uh, looking at prof all professional athletes. I think it was the big, the big sports, hockey, uh, football, uh, basketball, um, and baseball. And they basically followed a cohort, so a retrospective cohort study. 226 players underwent discectomy. 116 athletes were treated non-operatively. Doesn't go into all the details of the non-operative treatment. Uh, they were diagnosed with a herniated disc, and they had a return to um, play, which was pretty comparable in the two groups. Of the, of the noteworthy exceptions or kind of the outliers, surgical treatment in baseball players led to significantly shorter careers, whereas for NFL athletes, uh, post-surgical careers were longer than those of corresponding non-operative non cohort. So baseball players kind of cut things off, kind of the reverse for the NFL uh, players, not sure why. So we're going to move up north to uh, cervical um, disc herniation and cervical epidurals. I'm just going to briefly touch on this. There's really not a good indication to do a selective nerve root block or a transforaminal approach unless you're concerned about which level is involved. And usually in young, young athletes, you know which level is involved um, because they only have one bad level and they're usually relatively healthy and they don't have three different levels of stenosis in the framing where you're trying to figure out which one. So for these, we usually do just a basic epidural uh, inner laminar and inject enough to cover the entire area. Again, you know, if you advance too far, you know, another half centimeter, the spinal cord is right there. So again, this is not done under sedation, and we like to have the patients uh, quite awake in case uh, they feel something in their leg they shouldn't, um, et cetera. Again, transforaminal responses, they had horrific res um, uh, side effects with a very few, but uh, they had strokes and reported deaths. Uh, not at Mayo, thank God. Okay, so. Obviously, for cervical epidurals, you want to avoid the level of stenosis. Typically, we go at C7, T1, or C6, 7, because that's where the uh, ligamentum flavum that we inject through is the thickest. Uh, again, transforaminal injections have led to some uh, catastrophic outcomes. Selective nerve root blocks can be used for diagnosis, and I've actually done them under ultrasound, where you can see the nerve roots pretty well. Unless they're inside linebacker thick necks, then it's no real benefit. Um, and I use fluor fluoroscopy to confirm. So let's move a little bit uh, off the axis, a few um, centimeters over to the uh, facets, and specifically PARS defects as well as facets. Again, the target area for the facet um, is quite self-explanatory. So I have a question. What do these athletes have in common? other than she probably weighs as much as uh, his thigh. <laughs> so he plays, well, he, I guess he plays for Detroit now, but he played for uh, the Ravens defensive lineman. Um, and she, uh, if you watched any TV in the last week, won gold for, for I guess, Russia or whatever they call themselves. Um, so they both have loaded extension of the lumbar spine and they're at risk for having a pars fracture. Um, again, that's, and they were both born on this earth. Other than that, there's not a whole lot in common. <laughs> so looking at a, a pars fracture, 
And this is where, the, with the young athletes, I always have a little bit of a dilemma. CT is the best way to definitively diagnose this. Obviously, if they have listhesis, you know they have um, a lysis or a fracture. Obliques give more x-ray, uh, more ra radiation, but that's the image of choice where you can see a broken neck in the Scotty dog. Here's the cartoon, and here's the actual broken neck. Um, you can see the outline, the eye, the ear, the nose, etc. Basically, a broken neck or a collar around the neck gives you your diagnosis. Um, so bone scan, if they're older, I, I'll get bone scan with spec to confirm it's actually active because a fair number of these, um, a lot of people had these injuries in their, in their youth and just carried on and they're just, um, they're just there. They're not necessarily symptomatic. So patients with spondylolisthesis could be followed clinically and radiographically for progression until they reach um, skeletal maturity. And there's no great evidence of PARS defect um, helping, but uh, in, this, in this basically um, cohort study, 87% uh, of young athletes with PARS defect were able to return to the original sport activities within five and a half months, um, which is pretty good. Again, no control. Um, so when you do these injections, um, Basically, the question is, do you inject in the facet, which a lot of times can end up filling in the PARS defect next door? So is it a kind of a combination injection, or do you actually inject in the PARS defect? And again, since there's no literature proving its efficacy, there's even less literature proving what's the perfect target. So anyway, but I think it's reasonable to try um, in a young athlete to see if it can give, give them some relief. Usually they have a PARS defect on both sides um, and not just one. So as far as facet referral patterns, um, the upper cervical facets can refer you know, all the way um, to um, the orbit, you know, all the way to the eye, um, basically wherever the occipital nerve goes. And as you march down, you can see kind of a typical referral pattern for different facets. Lumbar facets kind of can look like S1 radiculopathies. So, you know, when I finished residency, I, I thought I knew all this well, and kind of the more I've worked, the less I've learned, less I know as far as where the true referral pattern is. So, typically, the facet pain will be worse in the low back slash buttock, and it won't, it'll be a continuous line. It won't be a skip pattern, whereas an S1 radiculopathy, they could have buttock pain and heel pain or calf pain, but it's not going to skip if it's a facet. It's going to be a solid line. But it can definitely mimic, especially the lower lumbar facets, uh, mimic uh, S1 or L5 radiculopathy. Um, so they've, facet injections themselves have only shown to be prove, uh, have only proved to give you short-term relief. Selective nerve root blocks, um, excuse me, selective medial branch blocks leading to radiofrequency ablation have shown to give more prolonged relief. The disadvantage is basically if, if you radiofrequency the medial branch, you're also going to weaken the multifidi or the muscle in that area. And is that the true goal in someone who is um, trying to have a strong back for their sport that you're going to take out their multifidi or weaken their multifidi since they're innervated by multiple levels. And here's just an example of where the needle goes for cervical radiofrequency ablation and where the needle goes for lumbar radiofrequency ablation. So success varies greatly between 45 and 80 percent for facet injections. Um, there's a wide range of outcomes uh, likely results in uh, several factors, use of a diagnostic block, prior surgeries, lesioning technique, and target location. Relapse of symptoms may result in regeneration of the medial branch. So peripherally, the, the uh, nerves can grow back, and typically one-third of patients receive no significant benefit. So not a, a home run. And here's a, a, just a study in 12 pictures um, where they did facet injections for verified facet synovitis at L4-5, 
They had no response, and they went on to do radio frequency ablation. They did L4, 5, L5, S1. They did bonus levels, and the patients did better. Again, this is a co retrospective cohort study. So let's move a little further anterior to the disc. Obviously, we know that disc can cause a lot of pathology, especially in the young athlete. Um, so the criteria for uh, discogenic, discogenic pain uh, is not clearly defined. Uh, discography has been accepted in some quarters. I wouldn't say um, it's the gold standard. There is no gold standard. The problem with disc pain is to verify, you have to do pretty aggressive interventions. So I had a, um, several patients when I was back in Rochester where they're like, yeah, let's go do discography. And I, I said, okay, we'll order discography and end up having to treat them for worsening severe pain for a couple of years as a result of their discography, not of their original pain. So their, their discography pain was worse. So I'm very selective in the patients I'll send for discography since I'm not a big fan of writing perpetual opioids. So one of my criteria is, are you willing to undergo a fusion or definitive intervention um, in your disc if it's positive? And if they're on the fence, we're not going to do it because I don't want to make them worse just by studying their disc. The other issue is, more recently, they've looked at, uh, looked at uh, pathology studies, and they usually have to go, or a controlled disc is injected as well um, to make sure they don't have pain at every level, and there's been degeneration or more rapid degeneration in discs that have undergone discography versus discs that have not in a previously healthy disc. And here's an example of um, IDET and discography. Again, this, was, this technique was in vogue probably five years ago where they slink this um, radio frequency needle into the disc and heat it up and try to um, decrease the pain. The um, controls didn't do that much worse, um, excuse me, didn't do um, any better. So basically it was a neutral study. So what's available for discs? There's IDET, there's steroids, uh, there's uh, hypertonic dextrose, there's even methylene blue injection, showed 90% success rate in two-week follow-up, again, one study. I don't see many patients who have methylene blue injected. And there's biacuplasty, bi one study funded by uh, the makers of the needles uh, that showed positive results after one year. In this, basically, they placed a needle in on both sides and ran a current between uh, the two needles and um, cooked the disc in that region. Again, it's uh, not funded by insurance. So let's move a little further south to the sacroiliac joint. Again, that's one of them that's not pictured here. Now, sacroiliac joint referral patterns can look like facet referral patterns or S1 radiculopathies or L5 radiculopathies, in case you thought you had it all figured out. It can refer down the back of the leg. Typically, it starts a little lower, right over the um, intermittent or lower pole of the SI joint. So you're not going to have pain as high. But again, it can mimic radiculopathy. It can also mimic uh, facet pain. So in younger athletes, is it truly joint pain? Because we've obtained bone scans and MRIs of the pelvis, which showed really unremarkable findings as far as joint degeneration. Um, so maybe it's a ligamentous strain. Maybe it's some form of or some change in the biomechanics of the ligaments that hold the sacroiliac joint together. So treatment options where your imaging is truly unremarkable may include prolotherapy, dry needling, or trigger point injections. So fluoroscopically guided corticosteroid injections have only shown to pro provide short relief. There also has been developed radiofrequency ablation of the sacroiliac joint, where we basically uh, ablate the lateral branches, whereas we do the medial branches and the lumbar facet. Here we do the lateral branches. Again, uh, currently, uh, reimbursement is limited, slash, we're not doing it. Okay. <laughs> now, here's just an example of a sacroiliac joint injection. 
Um, it kind of looks like a wide open joint, but really the, the posterior um, window to get in is very small, but this is kind of a, the ideal look where you get a, uh, an arthrogram. And basically, when these go in and, and it truly is sacroiliac joint pathology, they do quite well. So what are some newer options? What are some options that are out there now? Um, well, you look at Tiger and you look at his last whatever procedures, and there's a big bullseye on his lumbar spine. Um, and you look at uh, Peyton um, before he retired, and both of them went to either Cayman or Europe. I didn't follow where they went, but to have regenerative Germ or Germany, wunderbar, um, to have interventions done there where the FDA is not as uh, strict. Again, there's no great evidence. Right now in Rochester, there's some studies going on looking at injecting into the disc with stem cells, but I'll let uh, Dr. Shapiro blow you away with his, uh, his talk with regards to what's out there. So regenerative medicine uh, is also being looked at for facets. <coughs> In a young athlete, I would consider it. Again, it's not going to be reimbursed, but if, if I had a choice between ablating um, the medial branches to injecting um, either PRP, platelet-rich plasma, or stem cells, um, and it was my kid. I used to say if it was me, but now if it was my kid, um, I, would, I would definitely consider it if they were a high-level athlete. They're not quite there yet. Um, so what else is out there? Um, more recently, there have been temporary peripheral stimulators. These are just wires that, you, that are put in for two months where you put Dermabond glue on the, on the skin uh, right where it comes out. And basically, they've stimulated the medial branches for two months and gotten a year of relief. And so here you've actually you know, increased um, electrical flow to the, to the nerve, and you haven't ablated it, and they've had pretty good long-term results. Again, this is more in the investigative phase, but I would consider these options for a young athlete before ablating um, if I thought there'd be a good chance. Um, I'm going to just glance over there also for severe injuries. These usually are athletes doing stupid things in their spare time where they lead to compression fractures. Um, usually it's uh, unusual to get a compression fracture uh, in the sport itself, though possible. Um, there's kyphoplasty and vertebroplasty. Ag again, aggressive interventions. And Calmes did a study again in Rochester that showed no dramatic difference between conservative care and um, kyphoplasty, again, the people who do the, a lot of kyphoplasty think the study it was fraught with error, but that's out there. Um, so what else is out there? There's muscle injections, um, in, injecting botulinum toxin, and uh, there's some evidence for that. Again, it's off-label use, so it's, it's going to be a little bit of a pocket biopsy. Um, corticosteroid injection, again, into the muscle is an option as well. Some of these are done under fluoroscopic guidance or ultrasound guidance due to the depth of uh, the structures involved. So again, what's new? Regenerative medicine, stem cells in the various location. Um, it's kind of the wild west since it's not uh, regulated as far as what can be done or it's not FDA approved. And Florida seems to be a wilder part of the west when it comes to these interventions. Um, and also, I've tried a few patients who had pure disc pathology on, um, actually two, on antibiotics based on this study out of Europe, and actually one got better. So again, the fact that there's you know, over 30 ways to treat disc pathology means we're not there yet. So in conclusion, fluoroscopically guided uh, corticosteroid injections have been shown to show short-term relief you know, two to three to four months, excluding discs. So patient selection is important, but uh, patient selection, uh, so, excuse me, carefully selected uh, patients for radio, radio frequency uh, ablation for both the lumbar facets and the SI joints have shown to be helpful. Uh, multiple studies have shown limited short-term pain relief. For the highly motivated athlete, there's a good chance that one of these injections 
will help them get back and return to play earlier. Thank you very much.